Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on polymers. Now this one is dedicated to AQA, so if you're studying A-level chemistry um, and it's AQA as your exam board, then this is perfect for you. So these are not generic resources, they're not uh, generic videos, these are actually dedicated to you. And in fact, there's loads of um, these types of videos, so these are the revision videos, the ones with the black screens, um, loads of types of revision videos for year one and year two, so the full range is there, as well as some generic whiteboard uh, tutorials as well, um, which are on my YouTube channel, and also um, some exam paper um, walkthroughs as well on Allery Chemistry. They're all for free. Um, all I ask is you hit the subscribe button just to show your support. That would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, also, um, you can actually purchase these as well. So you can have your own copy of these. They're great value for money. If you just click on the link in the description box below, you can get a hold of them there. Um, they are great for, say, your smartphone, your tablets, you can use them on the move. And I know some people who've print, uh, printed these out as well and use them for revision notes. So you can annotate, scribble all of them, which you can't do with a book, obviously. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, you know, they're, they're available there, great value for money. So go and take a look. Okay, so like I say, this is dedicated to the AQA specification. And so therefore it matches the specification points, as you can see on there. So this video is mainly going to look at condensation polymers. So we looked at addition polymers in year one chemistry so this one's going to be looking at condensation polymers and also we're going to be looking at the uses of the plastics and how they can be disposed of because clearly that's quite an important aspect of, of plastics um, in terms of obviously we make them when we know the, the the problems with some plastics and obviously um, some plastics are biodegradable as well so we're going to look at all that side anyway um, later on okay so let's have a look um, so we're going to look at condensation polymers, like I say. And so condensation polymers are actually split into three main types. So we have polypeptides, polyamides, and polyesters. So condensation polymerization is basically where we've got two different monomers, and they must have at least two functional groups to react together. Um, and when they react, we form a link, uh, a link between the two. Um, and water is eliminated and this is why we call it condensation polymerization so when we join two monomer units together with two different functional groups you'll see these in a minute um, but when we join these together we we actually eliminate water hence condensation contrast this with addition polymerization which you've seen before where we um, have an alkene and we open the double bond in the alkene to, to connect them to form um, longer hydrocarbon chains condensation polymers are different okay so so the link actually determines what type of polymer is produced. And like I say, you need to know three different types. So we have polypeptides, which are found in proteins. You have polyamides, which are found in diamines, and dicarboxylic acids, so reacting them together. Um, and polyesters are formed by reacting diols and dicarboxylic acids together. So in this topic, we're really going to be looking at polyamides and polyesters. Polypeptides are actually reserved for the amino acids topic, um, where we look at amino acids and proteins and DNA. So all that's really going to be covered in that topic. So this video is really going to be looking at polyamides and polyesters. So you can see here, here's your polyamide as an example, which is here, and then a polyester is obviously this example here. So this is used for um, rope, as you can see. So like Ben. Um, and builders rope, for example, on a construction site or anything like that. Um, and this is obviously using fabrics and polypeptides. These are proteins. This is like the white of an egg. So the white of an egg is pure protein. Um, so that's the um, th that's the the uh, protein that we're also the polymer that we're going to look at in the next video. Okay, so let's look at polyamides first. So polyamides are formed by reacting dicarboxylic acids and diamines together. Um, and so when we react that together, we actually form a link, which is an amide link. Okay, no surprise there, because it's a polyamide. And this is formed when we react dicarboxylic acids with diamines together. Okay, now the reason why we must have a di, you would have heard of these a little bit before, like carboxylic acids and amines, but with the word di in front, that means we must have two carboxylic acid groups per monomer and two amine groups per monomer that's what we must have so and we have to use these two because we need a functional group either side and we need that either side because that allows us to form chains all the way across okay so all the way across our polymer so that allows us to form these chains um 
and using obviously using a, a dicarboxylic acid and a diamine to, to do that to form your polyamide. So let's have a look at an example. So you can see here, here's our dicarboxylic acid. As you can see, what I mean a little bit more clearly there. So we've got a molecule there. We've got the R group in the middle. So there's the R group there. Okay, so this could be a, a carbon chain. It could be anything. Okay, so this is just kept it generic. But you can see here we have two carboxyl or two two carboxylate ions on the end here. Okay, so it's got one here and one here. So it's a dicarboxylic acid. And a diamine is quite simply just the same. It's just we have an amine group either side. So we have an amine group here, which is NH, remember? So you would have done that from the amines topic, if you've seen that video already. Um, and obviously, we've got two of them and an R group in the middle. So what we're going to do is join these two monomers together to form our polyamide. And so our polyamide looks a little bit like this. And you can see here that we've got our amide link in the middle and I've color coded it all and you'll see all the examples that I'm going to give are all going to be color coded so you can see where the atoms are going so you can see here we've got our carboxylic acid which are the ones in red so these are your carboxylic acids here and these are your amines here okay so these are your amines that are that your, your amine uh, monomer which is which is joined here now you'll notice that when we've joined these together we've eliminated water okay so here it is so it's these two here that's been lost when we've joined and water's been eliminated okay hence the word condensation now the type of link is an amide link so remember from the amines topic then amide is where you've got an nh group directly bonded to a carbon a carbonyl group which is here so that is an amide link and that's why we call them polyamides because we have a lot of these amide links repeated over and over again okay so quite straightforward and you can see why they're called condensation polymers because basically we eliminate water to form the link that we're forming which in this case is polyamide so let's have a look at a specific example so a specific example is kevlar now kevlar is a bulletproof material it's really really strong but less dense than steel so actually it's really useful for bulletproof vests and um, it's also used in car tires because obviously they're going to get quite a lot of abrasion um, with the tarmac um, and sports equipment as well it can be used for that it's lightweight but it is incredibly incredibly strong so it's a, a, a marvelous uh, material that was invented um, and kevlar is made from benzene one four dicarboxylic acid and 1,4-diaminobenzene. Now, you need to be aware of what is used to make Kevlar. You do need to know this, okay? So, it's not just an example. So, let's have a look. So, benzene 1,4-dicarboxylic acid looks like this. You've got your benzene ring in the middle there, and you've got your carboxylate ions on the end. So, flanking the sides of this benzene ring, okay? So, quite a, quite a big monomer. Um, and 1,4-diaminobenzene is very similar, except you just have amine groups either side. Um, so you can see there's a lot of uniformity here and you can kind of get an idea why Kevlar may be quite strong. Now, if we connect them together, remember, we're going to get rid of some water. So we're going to get rid of an OH here and a H here. And this is going to produce water. And likewise, we're going to um, lose a H here and an OH here on the end when they join to form further chains. So let's have a look. So there's your Kevlar and you can see that we've um, removed water. Uh, remove water from that completely um, and you can see Kevlar is really strong because these chains are really uniform okay and they can pack together quite tightly there's no bits sticking out or from different monomers they're pretty much the same so because they the fibers can pack together really closely um, that means they are actually uh, bulletproof they have really strong properties okay so this is the formula Okay, this bit here and the bottom, so that's the formula of Kevlar. Um, and the part in the brackets is called the repeat unit. So basically, in a polymer chain, you have multiple repeat units that are joined together. And you may be expected to identify what a repeat unit is in a polymer. So what you're looking for in a repeat unit is where you've got both, um, both uh, monomer units, so both the monomer units joining together, okay, um, and that is your repeat unit minus the um the oh and h on either side as well so you've got to remember that don't draw this and then join obviously your oh and h because i think this is the trickiest bit about polymers really polymers are fairly straightforward apart from trying to identify or draw down repeat units but you can see here obviously we remove the water here because they join to form the amide link here but you must also drop the same molecules on the other ends of the uh, monomer units as well as you can see here 
and we draw long trailing bonds at the end with square brackets and that is your repeat unit so don't be tempted to um, draw this and then just put OH on the end there and then H on the end there and not put your trailing bonds because that is not correct okay so just be just be aware of that okay so another example is nylon 66 so nylon 66 is another example of a polyamide that you do need to know uh, and as you've seen in the pictures before it's actually used in ropes um, it's really strong it's a durable material as nylon um, it's using carpets as well clothing parachute fabric etc so nylon is a really strong robust fabric to use it is designed for durability so nylon 66 and you might think well where's the 66 come from well you've got hexane dioic acid so hex meaning six uh, and then you've got one six diamino hexane so you can see we've got two molecules that contain six carbons each so let's have a look so there's your hexane dioic acid as you can see there so we've got six carbons in there dicarboxylic acid again um, and again we have a diamine as well okay but this time we have six carbons in there so that's why we call it six six it's the number of carbons in each of the monomer units that make up this nylon. You can get different varieties of nylon. You don't have to have 6-6. Uh, six, six. Um, you know, you can have um, other types as well. Okay. But the only example that you need to know for this exam is the 6-6 six, six one. So if we join them together, again, we're going to eliminate water. And we're going to form our nylon 6-6. Six, six. So water has been eliminated. But remember that this is a, um, this is a repeat unit. Okay. So this repeat unit is... Uh, this here with your trailing bonds as you can see and we've chopped off the hydrogen and the OH on the other side there you must remove them you know we can't have them there you draw your trailing bonds and that is your repeat unit okay as long as you remember that bit polymers are actually fairly straightforward there's nothing much to them okay so we've looked at polyamides we're now going to look at polyesters because that was the other type of condensation polymer that we need to know about and you've seen esterification in the carboxylic acid and derivatives topic and um, if you haven't looked at that i've done a video on that i've done a video on everything that you need to know for aqa um but um polyesters you know esters are made from carboxylic acid and an alcohol there's no different with a polyester except we're using a dicarboxylic acid and a diol okay the reaction's the same so Ester links are formed when we react these dicarboxylic acids with diols. So let's have a look. We know what a dicarboxylic acid looks like because we've seen it already. So there's just another example over there. But a diol is basically just a, um, a molecule with two alcohol groups strapped to it. Okay, so that's a diol that's, that's listed on there. Okay, now if we then join them two together again, it's a condensation polymer. So we remove water um from the molecules and we form our polyester now this time instead of having an amide link we have an ester link as you can see there so we know what an ester is there it is okay there's your ester link but again we've lost water so let's draw it in there there it is so we lose the water molecule um and this is why it's still called a condensation reaction okay so we've still got our polyester there with our ester link in the middle okay Okay, so there's only one example that you need to know uh, about polyesters, and that's terylene. Um, now, terylene is um, is used in plastic drinks bottles. Um, you might have seen it if you look if you've got a, a soft drinks bottle like um, uh, on your on your on your person or in your house or you know around you anywhere anywhere like that. You'll normally see um, at the bottom you'll see a little triangle. And it'll probably have a number in there. And that number tells you what type of plastic it is. But next to it, somewhere around there, it will say PET. Um, and that's basically what you make your plastic drinks bottles from. Um, it's also used in clothing as well. Some types of clothing and sheeting as well. So um, sheeting, for example, for say if you're, if you're painting or if you're wanting to cover up, um, you know, items of furniture, for example. So um, if you want to cover up a barbecue or, a, I don't know, outdoor furniture a motorbike you know anything like that basically any way you want to protect it from the elements you make it from terylene so terylene is actually made from benzene 14 dicarboxylic acid but well, we've seen that one before um and it's actually reacting with ethane 12 diol so let's have a look so there's our benzene 14 dicarboxylic acid very similar to what we've seen with um kevlar um except we're going to react with ethane 12 diol so um which is there okay and then once we react with that we then form our terylene molecule as you can see there and obviously water is also eliminated from this okay um no different there again what we're doing is removing the water molecule from here so removing an oh 
Um, so we're moving the hydrogen, sorry, from here and then the OH from there. It doesn't really matter too much. Um, so we're removing the OH and the H. So we move that from there and then we form our ester. But you've got to remove the same molecules either side of the um, of the um, of the molecules as well to draw your repeat units. Remember that, okay? The N, by the way, just just you might have seen that pop up. The N just means number of. So there's multiple repeat units. So it can be any number of them. Okay, so we've seen how we form polymers. So that that's called polymerization. We can actually then break down polymers, and we break down polymers using a process called hydrolysis. Okay, so hydrolysis um, just means hydro meaning water, lysis meaning to break. So it's breaking using water. Okay, so um, condensation polymers, these can be hydrolyzed, like I say, split using water, and they produce the original monomers. It's just the exact reverse of what we've just been seeing before. Now, this is important because actually, once we've purchased a product, we buy it. Obviously, it's manufactured, we buy it, we use it, and then we've got to get rid of it we've got to dispose of it now the disposal bit is is obviously the plastic has is really good properties when we're using it it's used everywhere this microphone i'm speaking into is plastic you know the screens that i'm looking at are plastic and um, the printer that's next to us is plastic as you can hear so you know there's a lot of use it's very durable and we can mold it into any shape you know has a lot of uses there but the problem is and you will have seen it um, you know you may have seen it on the media is that some plastics are really difficult to dispose of there um, they you know some plastics really don't degrade very well at all and can be stuck under the ground in landfill for for years and years and years so we need and chemists are and scientists are looking at you know technology to um, you know to, to create plastics which degrade under very low energy conditions and and one of the ways in which you degrade a plastic is through hydrolysis that's splitting a molecule using water okay so um, you know technology is here and this would be the you know the I suppose the future of plastics is looking at ones which you know once we've used them can we get rid of them and or either or mold them into something new or you know and can we reduce waste from them we'll look at that there's a big section of this on waste of plastics um, so anyway, so here we've got a polyamide, okay, we've got a polyamide um, polymer here, okay, um, and we're going to break that up using water, it is literally just the reverse of polymerization, it's unreal how, how um, you know, how, how simple this is, so there's your polyamide, we're going to add water to it, remember water is a product of polymerization, um, and then we form our two monomer units, so our dicarboxylic acid and diamine, I think the trick here is to work out what monomer units you're actually going to form, now, what the exam board are going to do is they're going to give you something a little bit more complicated, aren't they? So they're going to give you something really kind of with big benzene rings in and God knows what else, and sulfurs and all sorts. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Let them throw it at you. Okay, let them throw it at you. All you're looking for is that link. Spot the link. What is it? It's either going to be an amide or an ester. It's only one of them two. And then once you've spotted that link, draw around, draw a circle around it and bang, split it down the middle, straight down the middle. Okay, add a hydrogen on one and OH on the other. You've got to add water okay so just remember that okay you've got to add that obviously the different um you've got to add that to the to the molecule there now with this one really this should be a trailing bond coming out the side here okay so that's why it's two nh two o um so that should be a trailing bond there clearly with this molecule if it was on its own you only need one water molecule but we'll get all that changed um uh, in the in the slide as well but it just depends on what they're what they're giving you okay so um, you can see that we've got our, um, there we are, we've got our amide link. That's what we need to spot out. That's what we need to look out for. We need to try and spot that, okay, um, in the uh, in the repeat unit. And then what we do is we add the OH and H to each of the monomer units. So we add them on. Um, and then remember for polyester, we produce a dicarboxylic acid and diol. And for polyamide, as you can see on there, we produce a dicarboxylic acid and a diamine. Okay, so just make sure you're looking really carefully. Um, you're looking really carefully at them. You know, at the link, the link that's in there. It doesn't matter what the rest of it looks like. Just look for the link and then add your OH and H respectively. Uh, you know, onto your molecules. Okay. Right. So um, condensation polymers are actually um, better at degrading in in the ground than addition polymers addition polymers are the worst ones to break down they're really unreactive but condensation polymers have polar bonds in there okay because of the co and cn bonds that exist in these polymers and because of these polarity because of this polarity it actually means that they are fairly reactive with water 
um, and so therefore they can degrade. So there we are. So condensation polymers are usually more rigid and stronger than the addition polymer ones. So they're, they're normally, uh, for example, Kevlar is much stronger than any addition polymer that we've seen. Um, and your condensation polymers actually have polar bonds, like I say. And what these can do is they can, these can interact with each other. Um, and they can interact, as you can see here. So we've got a delta negative um, uh, oxygen and our delta positive hydrogen. They can interact in this way. There we are. So we have our hydrogen bonds between each one of them. And this actually increases the strength of these polymers in it, um, as opposed to um, addition polymerization. But like I say, um, it also works as well for the breaking down of these polymers. Um, so um, if you use water, because of the polarity on them, they're more susceptible to attack from polar solvents like water. So this means that um, condensation polymers can break down more readily in soil than um, than addition polymers. But this is obviously looking at the strength of these condensation polymers um, and using, you've got to be able to obviously identify where your hydrogen bonds are. Always put your lone pair of electrons on your oxygen um, and put your, your delta positives and delta negatives on there just to show the examiner really clearly you know what what you're after okay uh, right so let's have a look at some use of these polymers so we've looked at the kind of uh, the intricacies of the molecules and how we react them so now we're going to look at how we use polymers so polymers are useful however disposal of them must be carefully managed okay like I say we've got to be really careful with these um so let's have a look at where we can use them from so your synthetic polymers this is what I was saying about PET so it's in these plastic drinks bottles so um synthetic polymers are made from monomer units and they're used to make a range of items like I say so we can use um, PET in plastic bottles we can use Teflon um obviously in your non-stick pan that's a coating uh, like a, a coating on the surface of the uh, on the surface of the steel uh, and also we can use it for um you know gadgets like this um i think that's an apple watch i'm not massively up to uh, up to speed on my uh, i've got a very cheap basic watch um so um I, it looks like an apple watch i think or some kind of smart watch anyway um so you can see that we use um you know the, all this fancy technology to create uh, quite nice looking items like that okay so um these are all made from so obviously synthetic polymers. These are man-made polymers. And condensation polymers such as polyester and polyamides are polar, and hence they are susceptible to attack from nucleophiles. And this is what I was saying before, is that they're biodegradable. They're broken down by hydrolysis slowly, and thankfully there's a lot of water around. So these, if you're going to make any form of plastic, these plastics are the best plastics to use. But of course, it depends on the properties. You wouldn't make your watch out of Teflon. Uh, you know, and you wouldn't make drinks bottles out of Teflon either. So, um, you know, so it just depends on, you know, what, what the use is, what the properties that it has and what use you want it to do. Okay, so polyalkene, such as polyethene, for example, is an addition polymer. Remember what we said about addition polymers? And they are saturated molecules. They don't have any polarity in there. And they're actually pretty unreactive. Now, because they're unreactive, they, um, they really don't degrade well in... Um, uh, in landfill so we've got to be really really careful um you know about what we do with these types of plastics and ideally with addition polymers um you know we'd really want to um you know we'd really want to maybe recycle these um and remold them into something new rather than put them into landfill because they will literally be around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years um and they you know there'll be very little difference in them and we are improving you know the plastics we're seeing in the shops now you know obviously the especially in the UK, obviously, if you're watching this outside the UK, but within the UK, there's, um, you know, there's charges, and it has been for a while, on carrier bags, trying to encourage people to reuse, uh, you know, thicker, more durable carrier bags. That reduces the amount of waste in the landfill, um, you know, of these uh, of these of these bags as well and so there's loads of you know there's there's loads of ways and we know that um some supermarkets for example are removing packaging from fruit and veg um you know and just having it as raw you know do you really need packaging you know is it just there to make it look more attractive or does it actually have a practical purpose so you know supermarkets are using different ways and trying to use um you know less plastic within their you know within their products and you know there is a um you know a tendency towards trying to you know reduce our plastic use and maybe reuse it a little bit more Okay, so there's our plastics and our polymers. Now we need to look at the ways in which we can actually dispose of these um, because 
there is num- there is a number of ways in which we can either you know which we can get rid of polymers. Uh, one of them, as I've said already, is landfill. It's not the best option uh, because we literally just put it in a hole and just leave it. Um, but most polymers are not biodegradable, so we've got to be very careful very careful with them like i say audition polymers are not biodegradable um but landfill is useful for disposing of plastics that are really difficult to recycle some are not that difficult they may have um you know metal components in there they may have bits of um foil on there you know it, it might be really difficult to separate the plastic from other parts um they might be like i say difficult to separate from other materials that's the second point and also um there might be not enough plastic to extract it to make it economically viable there may only be small amounts of plastic in it um in which case it's a case of it might be for example a bike a bike's mainly a metal frame but it has some plastic components on it um which may be things like um you know reflectors for example it might not just need not not economically viable to remove to get somebody to remove them reflectors from from the bike and recycle it so it does depend you know there is an economic factor here as well and so when waste decomposing landfill it actually produces greenhouse gases um, and obviously there's a risk of water contamination as well so you get leaching from the landfill that can run into the water course which then goes into the sea and obviously that can affect particularly if you get your water from, um, say, uh, reservoirs, as we do up here. So I live in uh, Northumberland, where our water comes from uh, Kielder, which is a reservoir. But if you live in a city like London, you know, that will be, you don't have reservoirs in, in you know, um, you know, reservoirs of drinking water, um, or large reservoirs anyway, to supply all of London, for example. And so you have underwater ground, you have aquifers, which can, um, you know, wh- where you, you draw your water from, or it's, it's piped in from... Um, from other places so um, it's really difficult to um, to stop uh, leaching or bio leaching from landfill so they have to be managed properly these sites not just a big hallway you put rubbish in they have to be professionally managed and monitored as well by the environment agency so landfill is not very sustainable large amounts of land is needed it's really expensive and there are taxes there's landfill tax the government um, uh, tax um, in the UK at least anyway so they tax um, putting uh, waste into landfill to try and discourage um, um, you know councils or local authorities from using landfill as an alternative it's really expensive for them so they will that then naturally feeds down to the people where they say they encourage you to recycle because it saves it saves money so so there is a deterrent there to not use landfill um, and so obviously we need to look at other ways in which we can dispose of plastics Okay, so another way which you might not have thought about is incineration. Um, now, incineration is, is, as it says, it's just burning of waste. And so plastics, um, incineration um, or burning of waste plastics could be used if the plastics can't be recycled. And actually, what we can do with the energy from this, when we burn the plastic, we can actually use it to... Um, uh, you know to generate electricity so we can actually get some good from it so it's seen as a, a better alternative to landfill because we can actually get something positive from it um however um the problem is is that when you burn you should never burn plastics um uncontrollably because they do release toxic fumes um you know we need to be really careful for example pvc which is polyvinyl chloride if you burn that um to pvc or upvc is used for example in windows and um, now if you burn a window frame um like double glaze a window uh, then you'll produce harmful hcl gas which is really acidic and you absolutely do not want to be breathing that in because it can cause long-term uh, damage to your lungs and airways so we've got to be super careful with that now you might think well hang on well if we're burning these plastics in these factories surely this stuff's going to escape out of the chimney well these companies and right rightly so have to install uh, uh, flue gas scrubbers in there and what they do is they neutralize the acidic gas um, and they basically fire a base at the gas as it goes up the chimney neutralizes it turns it into a salt which then obviously can be collected at a at a at a later state later later stage so it stops these harmful emissions from going into the atmosphere because obviously we've got to be you know we've got to control these things quite carefully we do not want um you know these horrible fumes um from going into the atmosphere and people breathing them in so you know there are obligations um of companies that that incinerate waste to make sure that they are adhering to strict um environmental rules and laws as well okay 
So the other type of way which they which we can dispose plastics is they can be recycled. So most polymers are not biodegradable, like I say. So we need to try and um, you know come up with different ways such as doing this. And this is probably the one that you're most familiar with. And in the UK, we are really trying to encourage people to do more of this, which is recycle. Okay, and there's a lot of money that's gone into this. Um, you even have separate bins, as you can see, to um, for plastic. So. Um, so most plastics, like I say, they're made from crude oil. That's a non-renewable source. Okay, so that means once we've dug it out the ground, it won't come back again. Okay, um, so recycling, um, recycling means that reducing dependency in crude oil for making plastics. Crude oil um, is 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 expensive uh, because it's increasingly becoming more rare or rarer, should I say, unless we find new oil reserves. But um because um because of its increase in cost plastics become more expensive as well so actually it becomes economically viable now to take the plastic melt it down and remold it into something new okay into something different so um that is is better because it preserves um precious natural reserves like crude oil and also it could also be cheaper it depends on the type of plastic and the raw materials required but some plastics, like polypropene, for example, um, which is a, an addition polymer, uh, can be remoulded into new objects. Now, it's just as well, because if you put that into landfill, it really isn't, um, really isn't going to degrade um, very well at all. So if we can reuse that, it means we're not putting that type of plastic into landfill. So other plastics can be cracked. So um, polymer chains can be broken up. So you would have seen this in year one chemistry with crude oil. So when we crack crude oil, it uh, can be broken up into monomers and used as organic feedstock for other plastics. So we don't have to just remold it into something new. We can actually break it down completely and use the monomers to create a completely different plastic altogether. So, you know, the, the technology is really advancing quite rapidly on this area um, of, um, of waste management. So, um, you know, and, and hopefully we can get to a stage where we, we literally throw no plastic into, um, you know, into landfill because it, you know, it can be swept into the oceans. And, you know, you may see documentaries on it about plastics floating around in the ocean. So, you know, there is an immense amount. And it really is down to scientists and chemists to develop new technologies to, uh, you know, to develop these plastics that we use every day. We can't avoid them. They're just they're in your clothes now. Um, you know, it's just about, you know, how do we how do we benefit from them but not harm the environment? Okay, so we're going to look at the last bit, which is the um, advantages and disadvantages of the pros and cons of recycling plastics. Okay, so um, let's have a look at the disadvantages first. Um, or, well, one of the disadvantages, then we'll look at an advantage. So we'll go through it one by one. So the disadvantage is that plastics can be contaminated with other materials. I don't know if you've um, taken something, obviously we've got recycling bins here, we've got blue recycling bins, wheelie bins um, in Northumberland, but you may find that um, you know sometimes you look at it and think, can that be recycled or can it not? And you know, is there certain things which um, you know which are really difficult to recycle because it's got other things attached to it, um, you know, which may not make it recyclable. So, um, so you've got to be really careful with um, you know with what can and can't be recycled. And somebody at the other end has to. F Normally, you've got machines that can sort that out. But you might have to have somebody at the end manually ripping bits off the or you know the item if there's metal on there or card or something like that. So an advantage um, is it's cheaper to recycle plastics than make them from scratch. So that's a good thing. So we don't have to dig up crude oil. Another disadvantage is it's really difficult to recycle plastics um, due to the wide variety of different plastics. You may find that some of your plastics you'll think well local authority doesn't uh, doesn't take them. Um, because they don't have the, you know, the, the, the facilities to actually sort that out. Um, you know, in some places, they may ask you to separate them out completely um, you know, and say, right, well, I want you to separate it into the different types of plastics um, because they'll go to different processing sites. In Northumberland, we just put it all in one bin, and it's obviously sorted somewhere else, but I know some areas where you'd have to sort it out yourself. Um, another advantage is less carbon dioxide is produced when recycling plastics than incinerating them, so there's an advantage. Another disadvantage is it's really difficult to remake the original plastic from recycled material. So what you'll find is the recycled material is normally chopped up into small chunks, remelted and then moulded again. So it's really difficult to exactly replicate the original plastic that it was. We normally have to, um, you know, chemically treat it or ch change its uh, change its structure a bit. 
Um, another advantage is recycling reduces the reliance on landfill. Clearly, if we're recycling, there's less going into landfill. That's got to be better for the environment. Um, another disadvantage, the last disadvantage, is the sorting. Remember what I said is that when that recycle is, uh, is, is collected, it has to be sorted. Um, and that's expensive. You know, it's far easier just chucking it into a furnace and burning it. So it's a, it's a lot more labor intensive trying to recycle, uh, recycle the items. And one more advantage um, is recycling and preserves non-renewable raw materials such as crude oil. So we're not having to rely on crude oil to produce our plastics. Okay. So there's a lot of pros and cons in there. You need to be able to give advantages and disadvantages of recycling. Um, and obviously there's four there for you to pick from of each. So as long as you're familiar with them, that's the main thing. Right, and that's it. So that's the end of um, this video on polymers. Um, as you can see, it's all to do with condensation polymers and um, the proteins. Um, so polypeptides will be done in a, um, another video um, to do with uh, proteins and DNA. So that's all in there. So if you want to know about that, that's in there. Um, but like I say, there's a full range of AQA videos. These revision videos on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. There's also um, a um, whiteboard tutorial as well, going through some generic information uh, for chemistry. And there's also some exam paper, past paper walkthrough as well. Go and have a look on there. It's all for free. All I ask is you hit the subscribe button. That'd be absolutely fantastic. And remember that if you want to um, buy these, um, they're really good value for money. Great for revision. Click on the link in the description box and you'll be able to get a hold of them there. Okay, that's it. Bye-bye.